everyone. Welcome to Learning Literature with Purva. In this video, we are going to discuss the general prologue to the Canterbury Tales. At first, we will discuss the opening section of the prologue and follow it with the description of the pilgrims that Geoffrey Chaucer has introduced in the prologue and then we will discuss the concluding section of the prologue. So whether you are pursuing your masters or preparing for UGC net exam, the general prologue to the Canterbury Tales is extremely important. So if you haven't yet subscribed to my channel, then do subscribe to it and hit the bell icon so that you never miss an update. Geoffrey Chaucer wrote the Canterbury Tales during the third stage of his writing career, which is called the English stage. Chaucer took the general idea of the tales from Boccaccio. The magnum opus called Canterbury Tales is the greatest individual accomplishment of Chaucer. The general prologue to the Canterbury Tales begins with a beautiful description of spring. It is the month of April and Chaucer says that April is the sweetest month of the year. After the harsh winters, spring is the ideal time to go on a pilgrimage. Chaucer also describes the time of pilgrimage in terms of astrology. He says that the sun is coming out of Aries, the first sign of the zodiac. The 29 pilgrims plus Chaucer, the narrator, comes from different parts of England. Their diverse backgrounds show a miniature version of the 14th century society. So all the pilgrims plus Chaucer, the narrator, assemble at the Tabard Inn at Southwark because they are going on a pilgrimage from London to the tomb of St. Thomas Becket who was martyred in Canterbury Cathedral in 1170. The fellowship of the pilgrims show a sense of community. Now let's move to the portraits of the 21 important pilgrims that Chaucer has described in the prologue. So the first pilgrim is the knight. He is a brave, chivalrous knight, gentle in speech and manner. He looks simple yet dignified in his rough tunic. He has won many battles and military campaigns. He looks a bit out of place in the age of declining chivalry. Next we have the son of the knight, the squire. He is a young courtly lover of about 20 years old. He is aspiring for knighthood in the future. He can sing, write, draw, joust and compose songs. And he has a handsome physique and curly locks. Next pilgrim that we have is the yeoman of the knight. The yeoman is characterized by his green dress, horn and the talisman image of Saint Christopher. He has a sunburnt face and a close cropped head. He carries bows, peacock feathered arrows, sword, shield and a dagger. Next is a prioress who belongs to the ecclesiastical class. Her name is Madame Eglantine. She is well-bred and comes from an upper-class family. She imitates courtly manners and possesses many pets. She is modelled on the heroine of courtly romance. She wears a brooch with the motto, Love Conquers All. Next we have the monk who also belongs to the ecclesiastical class. His name is Duan Pius. He identifies himself with the new world of wealth, luxury and pleasure. He loves hunting and he is against the Augustinian ideals of asceticism, renunciation and cloistered learning. He is bald and wears foppish clothes. Then we have the friar who also belongs to the ecclesiastical class. Friars had to take a vow of poverty, follow the teachings of Christ, perform good deeds and preach all around the country. The name of the friar in Canterbury Tales is Hubbard. He is a corrupt friar whose income is always exceeding. 
he plays on the religious beliefs of people he visits the taverns and houses of the rich while completely abandoning the sick and the poor his habit of lisping is a sign of his lechery with gifts songs and trinkets he seduces women and then finds husbands for them the next pilgrim is the merchant who belongs to a very rich and powerful class in england chaucer's merchant is actually in debt he tries to maintain his financial reputation by boasting about his profits and bargains he wears neatly clasped boots a flemish beaver hat and conservative clothes the next pilgrim is the clerk chaucer's clerk is a university student who is aspiring for a career at the church he is a poor and unworldly scholar he feels happy to have 20 volumes of aristotle by his bedside he relies on his benefactors and when he cannot repay them he says a prayer for them the next pilgrim is the sergeant of the law the sergeant of the law is one of the king's legal servants chosen from barristers of 16 years of standing so the sergeant of the law in canterbury tales is very rich and he gets lots of gifts from his clients he buys a lot of land his legal expertise helps him to unrestricted possession of property the next pilgrim is the franklin the franklin or the free man meant a substantial landholder he has a white beard his bread ales wine and meat are of the excellent quality he has been a member of the parliament and he changes his diet or menu according to the seasons of the year next we have the cook the cook is a culinary artist who is not exactly likable he has a sore on his chin later the host accuses him of selling stale unhygienic and contaminated food the next pilgrim is the shipman the shipman dresses wonderfully like the yeoman he is from dartmouth despite being the owner of the ship called mortalin he unlawfully attacked other vessels at the sea the next pilgrim is the doctor of physic he is a capable doctor who had good knowledge of medieval medicine he watched his patient and chose the astrological hours that would be most favorable to the treatment He also used the theory of humors to treat his patients. He rarely read the Bible. Chaucer especially emphasizes on the doctor's love for gold. The next pilgrim is the wife of Bath. Her name is Alison and she comes from a place called Bath. She has been married 5 times. She can easily mix in male company and is skilled in the art of love. She loves traveling and is an experienced traveler. She has been to Jerusalem, Rome and various other shrines. She is deaf and her teeth is said wide apart. In the pilgrimage she is wearing a white hat, protective skirt and shoes of expensive leather. The portrait of the wife of Bath is that of boldness, frankness and vitality. The wife takes a lot of pride in her skill in weaving. The next pilgrim is the parson who belongs to the ecclesiastical class. He is committed to his pastoral responsibilities. He is holy in thought and speech. His wealth is completely spiritual. He forgives the sinners who are repentant. He never forces the poor for taxes. He practices what he preaches. The next pilgrim is the plowman. The plowman is the brother of parson. He exemplifies the dignity of 
labor. He lives a life of charity unruffled by pain and pleasure, loving his neighbors and God. The next pilgrim is the miller. The miller has massive physical strength. He is short-shouldered, has a fat face with red bushy beard. His nose has a word on top. He is a shameless, quarrelsome, talkative and a lecherous person. The next pilgrim is the Mansupal. He comes from the inner temple. Just like the miller, the Mansupal is also a cheat. His deceiving powers are ironically described as wisdom. The next pilgrim is the Rebi. The Rebi is the perfect competitor of the miller when it comes to devious dealing. He is cunning, shrewd and a cheat. He is a slender choleric man with thin calfless legs. The next pilgrim is the Samana. He has a red fiery face full of eruptions. The Samana suffers from a type of leprosy due to his uncontrolled lechery. He is as lecherous as a sparrow. Children are afraid of him. He loves garlic and onions. He drinks strong wine till everything gets hazy. He is immoral and corrupt. Finally, we have the corrector of the pardoner who also belongs to the ecclesiastical class. The pardoner arrives freshly from Rome with his newly collected relics. He has yellow hair, a goat's voice and is beardless. He carries a pillow which he claims to be Our Lady's veil, a cross and some pig's bones. He cheats poor parishioners with these relics. After Chaucer describes all these pilgrims, he returns to the Tubbard Inn where all the pilgrims had assembled. Harry Belly, the host of the Tubbard Inn, arranges a hearty supper for the pilgrims. In a playful spirit, the host suggests that the pilgrims should tell stories so that the journey to Canterbury becomes interesting. Each pilgrim should tell two stories on the outward journey and two stories on the return journey. The person who tells the best story gets a free supper at the Tabard Inn paid by the pilgrims. The host decides to accompany the pilgrims to Canterbury. All the pilgrims agree to the host's proposal. The next morning, the host invites all the pilgrims to draw lots. The person who will draw the shortest cut shall begin the game. The knight draws the shortest cut and begins the game with pleasure. So, Canterbury Tales would have been a collection of 120 stories. But unfortunately, Chaucer could complete only 24 stories before his death. So, we have 24 stories in the Canterbury Tales. There are only two prose tales in Canterbury Tales, The Parson's Tale and Chaucer's own Tale of Melibius. The other 22 are verse tales. The first story is the knight's tale and the last story is the parson's tale. And in Canterbury Tales, we have three classes of pilgrims. One, the nobility or the royal class. Number two, the ecclesiastical class. And number three, commoners. So that's it for today's video. If you found the video helpful, then do like it and share with all your friends. Many questions are asked from this section of the Canterbury Tales. So I hope you found it useful and do subscribe to my channel. I'll be back next week with a new video on a literary work. Stay tuned to Learning Literature with Purva and thank you for watching.